Thank you. That's helpful. Um, so thank you, Predictor. And I will say it was uh, a really big joy as well, just playing cricket on the gardens of Trinity College and other colleges around Cambridge as well, and uh, enjoying the teas and all of those things you come to associate with Indian cricket. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I'm anywhere near the standard of the Big Bash or IPL, but uh, it's definitely fun. Um, fun coming together and just expressing ourselves on the cricket field you know so we can definitely talk about that and, and if you guys have any questions about cricket I just want to talk there and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn because uh, I always uh, very passionate about it shall we say. Um, just to give a little bit more of my bio so I did computational social psychology at Cambridge. Um, what that essentially means is using um, larger sources of data that is traditional in psychology with more advanced modeling techniques to try to extract new insights about human behavior um, for example, my PhD really focused on the personality predictors of happiness. And for that, we applied machine learning um, and um, in the process was able to extract much more granular associations between personality and happiness that had been done before. Uh, from there, I pivoted across to Google as a quantitative UX researcher on search ads, uh, which is a very traditional step for a quantitative researcher um, moving into industry. And that motivation was really to have a more applied impact uh, and Google was a lovely landing spot, but uh, everyone always asks, well, why on earth did you choose to leave Google? Um, that seems absurd. Everyone wants to be at Google and, they, and a lot of people tend to stay for a long time. Um, but there are always trade-offs involved and it's always about your personal preference. Um, at a place like Google, it's so large that you don't necessarily uh, have to have that much opportunity to really impact the life and death of a product. You're often dealing with very, very siloed parts of the code base, for example. And so um, then I moved across to Sendoso, which is a corporate gifting platform. And so we basically try to automate the process of sending gifts um, to uh, consolidate business relationships. And those business relationships could be around sales and marketing, or they could be around um, retention and HR and hiring and things like that as well. And, and there are lots more opportunities to come. So that's my journey until now. And, and that journey is actually in some ways a reflection, I think, of the field as a whole for UX research. And so uh, it's a nice way to just segue into the topic today. So UX research uh, is, I think by any count, really not seen as one of the core essential functions in a tech org. And so first of all, you get your engineers and your designers because you need designers to do the front end and you need engineers to build the thing. After that, I think a necessary function is of course a product manager who can reconcile stakeholder perspectives, um, establish a roadmap and then uh, prioritize that roadmap such that we move progressively towards agreed upon goals across the organization. They are the technical CEOs in the product org, as many of you know. After that, um, I think that's where other uh, functions start to come in. And so research is really one of those functions. And another is, for example, operations. So operations to smooth the entire process uh, in terms of the tech stack you're using, in terms of standardization, in terms of delivery times, measurement, et cetera, et cetera. And then research for a combination of evaluative work. Uh, evaluative work is where we evaluate front-end work to make sure that it meets users' needs. Foundational work, which is a core understanding of the users, and then increasingly strategic work. And the focus today is really on the strategic part of that, I would say, and the opportunities for UX research moving forward. That said, I do want to say that research is not as important as design or front-end. And so uh, I... I just want to preface everything I say for now in that an organization can survive without research. However, in tech, what we really think about is risk. And it's all about placing good bets. You might have a one in 100 chance of having a successful company if you do not deploy a research function. But if you deploy a research function, maybe you can increase that to a four in 100 chance. And that is really where research returns value. This is all a calculated bet. The VCs are out there in the valley um, making these appraisals based on the probability a company will succeed or fail. And my argument today is not that research can turn a bad company into a good company or that research is as important as engineering or design, but that research can make these better bets. And so with that, moving forward, I'll just give you a couple of examples. First, about failures um, and specifically um, some of the causes of these failures and perhaps where research could have been more involved. And then I'll tell you my journey, and this is really the journey of UX research. Uh, I'd say I've had a very uh, traditional path from where UX research has been to where it's going. Um, dip briefly into Agile Dev, 
but that's just basically to set the stage for the future, which is product-led growth and the topic of this uh, talk. So in terms of failures, uh, unlimited resources do not guarantee success. So here is just one example. Uh, Google Plus was obviously a social media network um, that Google attempted to solve. And ultimately what happened with Google Plus was they tried to compete with Facebook. They tried to, uh, and in the process as well, they tried to integrate uh, many of Google's suite of functionality into this one kind of social media tool. But the problem with Google Plus was they were trying to move against Facebook, which had already solved the need in their space, number one. Uh, and number two, um, it wasn't exactly clear um, what value add the ability to integrate all Google's tools in sort of a social media type context would actually serve the user. Chrome, of course, does a pretty good job already at a lot of that. And there are other places to sort of aggregate. Uh, also across Google's suite of tools, uh, there's, you know, generally speaking, kind of a lack of friction, universal login, et cetera, et cetera, that meant this process was like more or less redundant. The other thing as well about Google Plus was Google, according to this article, was really um, roped into its own mission statement. And its mission statement was to organize the world's information. In fact, it still was when I was there as well. The issue with that is that's not really what Google does best. And so they felt like um, they, they, what they do best is search, essentially. And what they do in search is um, quickly surface information. So it's, it's retrieve information fast rather than organize it in the first place. And so Google Plus was an attempt to help you organize all your social information when that really wasn't the value prop of the company. And so this, or, or, or how the company addressed user needs. And so really, this was a nice example of Google kind of believing its own rhetoric rather than listening, direct, listening directly to the customers. And hence, they offered a product that didn't return value. And where we talk about risk, it's Google spent $600, $600 million launching Google Plus before taking into account other collateral costs in the company. And had they brought on a user researcher to, or a series of user researchers to sincerely look at what unmet needs were there in the market, um, they could have significantly increased their chances, I would argue, of servicing a need that wasn't already met. And so you can think around the time that Google Plus came about, you could easily have um, seen the opportunity for a, um, I forget the name of the social app now, briefly, TikTok, there we go. You could have seen the opportunity for TikTok or you could have seen the opportunity for maybe a more local social networking app as well, which addresses an unmet need and it didn't really achieve that. Moving forward, why Vine died? Vine failed to create a moat for itself that was effective. And so Vine, Vine had six second rolling clips that were associated with um, Twitter, of course, uh, although they were on their own app. And Instagram came about, had a wider user base and allowed 10 second clips. And there were other alternatives as well, Snapchat, for example. And so this was a classic example of, yes, they initially caught and captured a user need. There was momentum around this, but they didn't necessarily build a moat for themselves. And the way, the way that users, uh, user research can really help and support that is to, again, look at users' needs around video sharing uh, and then help as well to identify what needs, what needs are unmet and then collaborate with product teams in order for those product teams to really make a determination about where to build and how to build in a way that isn't necessarily replicable by other social media networks. In addition, there was a lack of consensus in terms of growth by all accounts at Vine, such that the execs were not on the same page. And the best way to break an argument we find in tech is to place evidence in front of that argument. And so research could have been done to substantiate or to invalidate the claims of different executives ultimately to try and build consensus. And the third is VR. Now this is controversial because I think we all agree that screens are kind of challenging, right? And to live in a VR world would be extremely exciting. Uh, Oculus is a cool product and it's a product that doesn't have a market. It doesn't obviously solve a gaming need. It doesn't obviously solve any technical need either. And so right now we've done, Facebook have essentially made the tech uh, because they could and because they're at the point now, I think, given their profit, profitability and their stature, that they can try to take these big world-changing bets. Google have done something similar with Waymo, for example, self-driving cars. But they're trying to enter a market, again, where 
where gaming on PCs is already highly developed and they don't really have another strong alternative use case. They try to move into fitness. Uh, they try to move into more technical applications. And uh, for example, surgeries or um, difficult engineering work. But um, those things right now um, are not necessarily keeping pace with technology. And so this is a classic example, again, of billions of dollars in this case being poured into a product that doesn't necessarily address a true user need. And for every Oculus that succeeds, there are you know, tens of thousands of moonshots that fail. And the argument from research is that smart business practice is really predicated on, on addressing core needs now and waiting for those needs to emerge and then solving them. That's a much less risky way than trying to create a new market for a new thing without necessarily defining what the user wants. So those are just three examples where again, user research had it played more of a central role, could have and, and perhaps should have helped to de-risk these projects and increase their probability of success. So hopefully you're decently convinced that UX research can return value to an organization. And now I'll just tell you a little bit more about my journey as well, and really kind of what UX has done until now. I think um, those of you, especially of a design background, will be familiar with some of this style of work and it clearly has value. But when we think of, again, research contributing to the life and death of a company, it's not necessarily clear that uh, research is kind of an essential function. And so this is my PhD. I looked at the seven traits that cause happiness. Uh, for those of you with a statistical background, um, basically what we did was we measured personality on 30 dimensions. Um, then we applied uh, machine learning, essentially, uh, unsupervised machine learning to um, cluster those personality traits and then associate each of those clusters with a happiness dimension. And in doing so, we found seven traits that were really strongly emergent. And those traits, just so you know, uh, uh, include things like altruism, cooperativeness, self-discipline, uh, and then also assertiveness, which was very interesting. Uh, assertiveness, your ability to go out there and um, go after what you want. Uh, I should caution that this is predominantly a Western sample, however, and so this may not necessarily hold in India, but certainly in the US, it pays to speak your mind. Then I moved to Google, and I know the screen is pretty small, uh, but here is um, just an article which talks about Google's change in search listings. And what you'll see here on the right-hand side is that the ad label was green. Uh, it was in a green box. It was beside a green URL. It was below the headline, we call that. And they moved it up, they turned it black, and, um, and they changed uh, the font size ever so slightly, although it's difficult to notice. This was the culmination of a year and a half of work at Google. And this drove an additional $10 billion of revenue per year at Google. And there are a team of three of us working on this full time for that year and a half. And this is a classic example of UX research kind of coming in after the fact. There was only an idea through wide scale experimentation that we were going to do something like this change on the top here. However, um, because Google is so scaled and there are, uh, I, I don't know at this point, over 2 billion daily active users, there was a need to cross our RTs and dot our eyes and be extremely buttoned up. And there was a compliance component to this as well, where we needed to make sure that our ads were transparently um, displayed to users as ads. We weren't being nefarious or deceiving users in any way. Um, users were satisfied with these ads and that in fact, um, that we could generate a conversion source of evidence which demonstrated that these ads would return value to the company. And so here, research was really an afterthought that was used, uh, if I'm being charitable, for or uncharitable, I should say, for political purposes. And it was worth it because without the research, it was unclear whether we would have been able to action the launch, but user research didn't actually shape any of the UI change. Then I decided to move forward because that was very, uh, that was very rewarding and educational for me, but at the same time, uh, my interests lie in a different direction. And I managed to join Sendoso, the corporate gifting platform around the time that it raised its $100 million Series C. And the state of the company was that we'd raised on the basis of a bootstrapped product. We achieved product market fit. We had a suite of features that um, was fairly comprehensive and serviced, a, serviced kind of uh, various users' corporate gifting needs. And this is things like, okay, we're gonna help you source and warehouse and then ship the kinds of gifts that you wanna send to your prospects or um, your staff. We are going to um, integrate with your tech stack 
so that you can send from your existing environment. And we're going to facilitate reporting through uh, centralized uh, customer relations apps like Salesforce. And so everyone gifts, everyone wants to gift, everyone wants to make it a component of their business workflow. It has proven ROI uh, in different domains. And so the promise of Sendoso was very encouraging. And the mandate that we had for our Series C was really around uh, building a product that it could actually get us to IPO. And, and so that was an opportunity for us as researchers to go in there and widen our scope. And, and I was sort of the, the founding member of that research team and, and have, have since been able to build up my own team. So in terms of the journey, my journey through research, we do traditional personas work. So this is really a qualitative description of the different kinds of people who are using our app today and who we need to build for. The intention of personas is always to generate empathy from the perspective of design, engineering, and PM, such that their intuitions are better honed and calibrated to these persona decks, um, and they can make decisions that are ultimately gonna serve our user needs better. Then you can move from uh, personas and, 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 and really sort of high level frameworks to more foundational insights. And so in our app, it's really important for our users to see the ROI that gifting is generating for them. And so here, what we've done is a share where you can see um, what, what revenue metrics our users care about most. And this is related to how they're incentivized. This is related to what they report to their bosses. And this is ultimately related to how well their own products succeed or fail. And so you can see at the top, for example, they care most about actual revenue generated. And at the bottom, they care least about platform behavior. And this is a good example, again, of, of um, research that gained a lot of traction, but done in the traditional mold, uh, where it is foundation, foundational. Then we get into more tactical work. And so tactical work at a high level informs specific launches. And here, what we were trying to do was um, rethink the global NAV. And the first part of the global NAV, um, that is, when you go into an app, um, the different ways you can navigate from the landing page, is to find what those global NAV items should be. And so we use a method called card sorting to find um, the key groupings from the perspective of the user, what users thought actions should cluster into at an intuitive level. And so um, they liked the idea of having a marketplace for our like, gifting products um, campaigns, which is the way in which you set up and enable these gifting products for people at your company to send, uh, a place to manage brand, a place to send and track your gifts, a place to monitor performance. Uh, and then what they didn't really care for were um, separate areas just dedicated entirely to sending uh, because um, the act of sending was kind of intrinsically tied to the five things I just mentioned above. Uh, and they didn't necessarily need like teams to be front and center because that's kind of a back end uh, administrative task they only need to do once. And so that uh, was an example of us moving toward design uh, implementation, I would say. And then in an extremely tactical way, uh, we get our mocks, we do usability testing, our concept testing. We have, that means we have users interact um, with uh, prototypes that we will ultimately potentially send uh, into a general release. And then we have users react to specific components of those prototypes and then offer guidance about how we can recalibrate them. And so here, for example, uh, when users are setting up and permissioning gift items to send to their, uh, to permissioning gift items and allowing their company to send gifts um, through the platform, what they really don't want to do is they don't want to have to disclose their goals to Sendoso because they feel like they've already done this elsewhere in their process outside of our app and our tool. And so one of the things we did here was we said, get rid of this page, um, plain and simple. And so from that, hopefully you can see that UX research is valuable, uh, but if I'm being honest, through iteration and through lower fidelity work, PM design and engineering will ultimately arrive at the same solution. Again, research was able to come in here and um, help our team get to that solution faster. But at the end of the day, given enough resources and iteration, um, the teams would have arrived at this point anyway. Now that could be the difference between life and death at a company uh, because speed is everything. You have a limited runway in terms of funding. Uh, and then also there are competitors always posi positioning themselves against you as well. And so this is not to denigrate the value of traditional UX research. It's just that 
um, research here is, uh, what I would say is not, it, it is not indispensable to the ultimate health of the product. I would say given unlimited resources and given unlimited time. Whereas, whereas if you contrast that to engineering, you can't have a product without engineers to build it. It's as simple as that. You know? And so when I think about positioning research for the future, it's really important to make sure that um, research is sort of seen as, you know, not on par with engineering, because I talked about how that's unfeasible, but, but certainly as indispensable, to product, uh, as indispensable to product success as it can be. So that was the journey until now. And I'll just pause for a second if anyone wants to interject with any comments. Anyone want to ask anything? Sorry, I think. Yeah. Yes, uh, Mike, uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, hi, Matt. Uh, so, Mike on this side, uh, I had a question is like, uh, as you said, uh, US systems can clearly bring uh, return value to the company, but it is still often seen as an optional function. So other roles can also arrive at the same location. Uh, I was doing a project and I'm feeling that uh, often the engineering team, which has come up with a key value proposition, we can say around a broader concept to develop as a product, might not be the real thing what the user wants. And we can figure out that from the, with the help of user research. So how do you frame this thing is like finding out the real value proposition what the user wants and what the team thinks like okay this could be a unique value proposition for our users without even talking to the user yeah it's, it's funny that um, i'm the one trashing ux research and then you guys are defending it um thank you for that question i i would say that the role of the pm is really critical here and so you have feedback from support tickets, for example, in Zendesk. You have feedback from customer support, typically with existing customers, the sales team about how that process is going. Then you have also PMs and designers who are able to do tactical research. And you typically have the voice of experienced people as well at the company. Uh, so for example, tech leaders and then also the founder. And early on, especially, the founder tends to have quite a good understanding of what the user needs because they ultimately created a product that was of value. And so, there's a certain threshold of company size and company complexity where everyone becomes siloed such that there isn't enough cross-pollination of those insights to arrive at um, a reliable conclusion and research kind of gains value then, I would say. But if the PM is strong enough, they can reconcile like all those different perspectives and through you know, the principle of triangulation often arrive at something that's fairly close to what the user needs. And so in this regard, yes, adding a researcher is more efficient. And yes, we would ultimately surface some things that are unknown to the team. But yeah, pending the quality of the team, again, there is an opportunity to arrive at their similar conclusions, at least at some point, I would say. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from here. Also, um, just looking at layoff data as well, um, researchers are the first to go. So partly that's just sort of how they're valued in a company too. It's seen as, it's seen as a, a value add and a nice to have. Um, but, you know, if we're really pressured on bandwidth, then uh, a researcher maybe isn't going to take the headcount that would be al otherwise allocated to engineer. Thank you. Yes, Pravit, Pravit go ahead. Um, I, I have a question on the previous. Hi, Matt. Uh, I have a question on. Uh, Previous slide, which was about uh, the Google ad uh, 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 changes you have made, uh, introducing a favorite icon. And we all often see that like uh, the effect of design changes, the effect size is often small, that it is difficult to often measure uh, and translate into the revenues. So uh, as you all rightly hinted, you have done the uh, re uh, retrospective research and uh, uh, convinced it. So my question is like, uh, uh, have you done, uh, did Google do any um, uh, A-B testing or MET uh, to uh, identify the numbers? Basically how uh, Google was sure that it was not due to other factors, but it is coming only due to the small changes that has done. Yep. At, at any given time, Google is experimenting on two to five percent of its user base, and those um, numbers are astronomically large. And by virtue of that, there's a statistical power to detect even very small changes. So um, many people, because of um, a phenomenon in psychology called change blindness, blindness, won't actually notice the changes that Google are deploying. 
uh, but they are they they collected sufficient data from an internationally representative sample to know with a high level of accuracy what those revenue gains would be before the general launch. All right. Right. Then also, by the way, um, Google used Ireland and New Zealand as um, entire mm -hmm. test markets. So um, because they tend to be representative of um, wider Western markets and specifically the US where the first general releases tend to occur. Um, and they themselves are, you know, closed smaller markets where um, they can generate high fidelity data that they can take back to the US. There is a problem with doing it in the US because of, for example, leaks as well, um, leaks and, and, and a negative press, uh, whereas New Zealand and Ireland are a little safer. Yeah, so we're, in, we're involved in that, and then we're also involved in offline experiments as well to validate that. <laughs> All right, Matt, thanks. Any other question? All right, Matt, I think we can proceed. And Praveen, if you are done, you may, uh, thank you. So yeah, Matt, I think we can proceed. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to pivot um, very briefly to Agile Dev. And uh, you guys are probably more familiar with this than I am, uh, but it is important to set the stage for the future because this is how dev teams are organized now. So first of all, there is some general sense of roadmap that is agreed upon by different sets of stakeholders. So um, there'll be some sort of brainstorming exercise. Um, typically, this will be a product briefing exercise where PMs and their leaders will go around uh, just writing out very short blurbs for what options we can possibly launch. Those things are then negotiated and socialized across teams and across organizations, such that you, such that you end up with a sequenced idea of what you're going to launch across cycles. Then um, that turns into a backlog uh, with a theme, which um, isn't a one-to-one -one mapping here because I took this off the internet, but um, where the theme might be an update account set up and you can then Break, you can then break that into a series of epics or um, sections uh, of the feature and then break those into um, specific sub features and then stories uh, which uh, account to specific engineering tasks that are each assigned uh, uh, a cost or a weight in terms of story points, in terms of how difficult and how long and time consuming they are to build. At that point, um, the Agile pod emerges as well, as, as well with these different stakeholders involved. And they're all working together dynamically uh, in order to um, ship against story points, essentially. Uh, and then um, in the actual Agile sprints, they are working with stories that are distilled into specific ticket items, and then they're filtering them through a Kanban, um, basically trying to push every one of these tickets as quickly as possible through the Kanban. Now, and then ultimately agile teams are measured on their burn down and velocity against their story points. Um, so how quickly they can get rid of these story points um, to the point where uh, they are at net zero story points, uh, which is the ideal state. Um, oftentimes you see burn down charts that are a little flatter or burn up um, in some cases when um, the problem hasn't been scoped appropriately, but um, this is ideal state. And the reason that I say all of this in agile dev is that the link between the product roadmap at the top of this section of slides and the end result is one-to-one. -one. In properly functioning agile companies, what is on that roadmap is what gets delivered. And through precise measurement and calibration over time, um, we get better at anticipating exactly how much we can do and we get better at road mapping. And so th there's sort of a feed feedback up process that feeds back down again. And the roadmap is really the mechanism through which research can influence product strategy. The roadmap is typically at least in its draft format, multiple launches out, um, maybe up to a year out, I would say. And by virtue, it really is far enough thinking that it incorporates marketing, go-to-market strategy, biz ops, uh, market sizing opportunities, uh, and then also obviously product strategy as well. And so I don't really operate, creates this environment where research, are, research has the opportunity to go in there and shape strategy. And a roadmap that is ultimately validated. Um, number one, if, if researchers survey the entire problem space, are comprehensive, understand and make a compelling case for the user needs, associate those user needs um, with a specific segment and then, and then put a price against that segment of this is how much this addressable market is worth and this is a probability that we think we can get there given these features, then research can ultimately shape the entire roadmap and the entire future of the product. 
So that's kind of my argument. And before then, um, waterfall is obviously a traditional approach to software dev as well, uh, where you have kind of one lengthy project brief that is ultimately handed off to a dev team and they, um, they pass it out and they distill it. That to me is a less democratic process. It's, it's much more dictated on who kind of writes the product brief um, because the process lacks transparency and it's fixed. And so there isn't this ability to dynamically adapt to changing user needs as well. And so Agile sets the context, I think, for UX research to have a really big impact moving forward. And that corresponds with the future and another big trend we see in tech, which is the rise of product-led growth. So product-led growth is really this idea that it's actually more cost-effective to generate momentum for the product within the product. And so rather than having expensive TV ads or maintaining really large and robust sales teams, steak dinners, playing golf, closing deals with VPs, uh, a much more effective strategy uh, is to build a product that A, users love, uh, B, has low costs to entry, C, returns um, value with additional time, and then D, compels users to want more. And so some features of product-led growth are um, really, really quick onboarding processes, uh, usually seeing value returned before actually um, having to pay any money. So think of free trials, for example. And then ultimately customers volunteering, I would say, um, to be contacted by salespeople uh, and marketing uh, and really qualifying themselves um, to use marketing parlance. That is to say, signaling to the company that they are an interested and high value customer. Uh, it also is um, very synonymous with custom product journeys as well. Journeys that are tailored specifically to your own behavior patterns, which may manifest as um, different dashboards and landing pages, or even different ideal customer journeys that have been designed in the app, the app or the experience in general. So that's PLG. Here are some success stories. Uh, I won't go into all of these, um, but uh, it's pretty clear that they've all had to some extent or another viral network effects and they all allow you to interact with the product. In most cases right now, you could sign up for any of these and, and see immediate value. Uh, they all also, to contrast them with the failures in section one, uh, return and solve a clear and obvious need for the users. Uh, Spotify, music on the internet, Dropbox file storage before drive, um, and they've managed to maintain their market position. Um, Slack, like a really comprehensive chat app at work. So the first part of product-led growth from a research standpoint, is quite similar to what I mentioned in my PhD in that what you really need to do is segment your customers. Now, this is different from the personas, the personas work that I mentioned before. Personas work that I mentioned before is you interview a bunch of people, um, you talk about their needs, and then you kind of, um, on, a, on a whiteboard with sticky notes, kind of cluster them iteratively. And personas work also typically takes into account titles and roles. And so you want to ultimately kind of define and cluster people, uh, for example, who have marketing titles and then look at their needs. Personas work is different in the sense that what you do is you get, first of all, um, you try to measure and understand their, all their behavior in the app. And so you use dimension reduction to kind of characterize behavior in the app. Then you do something similar with the entire universe of possible user needs, which you then use dimension reduction to distill into a narrower survey. And in that narrower survey then, um, or I should say a more efficient version of the same um, survey that gets at the same sort of core needs as well. You then combine those two sets of data um, to get comprehensive profile of every customer in terms of their behavior and their observed needs. And so it's a bottom-up quantitative approach, which is necessary to be rigorous to truly identify your segments. And then what you do is a cluster analysis where you identify clusters of users who have similar needs. And given a large enough sample, you can make uh, an assessment, a quantitative assessment about how large that market would be overall. Obviously, there are some nuances in terms of who you pick for the study in the first place. But if you get one to 2,000 people, you can be pretty assured that this cluster of needs is the largest and this is the second largest. And so let's service these needs first. And so the first part of this is really hyper rigorous segmentation. And the reason for that in PLG is that we're often operating in really competitive markets where it's really easy to build product. And 
any competitor can come along and go and service a need. And so having just a generic understanding of, oh, okay, we're servicing marketers. Uh, what we think they need is just an ability to like store their gifts in a, in, in a centralized warehouse. Does not cut it. Because you can rent warehouse space pretty easily and you can develop a front end to have users interact and, and ship stuff to that warehouse um, without much trouble. What you really need is to say, okay, here are our segments. This segment right now then has very, very specific set of jobs that they need to do. These jobs, first of all, break down into the following meta sections. And then within that, break down into the following subsections. And within that, there are specific user stories. So again, um, corresponding to the kind of things that engineers would build for that talk about, hey, specifically as a user, I need to dot, 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 create custom shipping labels that allow me to um, attach, attach a label to a box um, of any size, at any quantity that gets to a location with reasonable certainty. And so that level of granularity then allows you to measure A, how well that user in that segment has currently had their needs met, met um, whether our comp competitors are positioning themselves to meet that need, and essentially what it would take for us to build, uh, in consultation with PMs and engineering, of course, and design, uh, what it would take for us to build something that better meets this need than a competitor um, and or um, finds a more cost-efficient cost solution to, to sort of service this need in this section as well. And that hyper level of specificity more or less guarantees, uh, well, I shouldn't say guarantees, but massively increases your confidence that you're building product that actually services a user need. Uh, and in doing so, um, that you will get traction in the market. Here are some examples of specific stories. These are still one level higher than what we would get to in a comprehensive jobs to be done analysis here. But for example, I wanna store my own equipment in the warehouse. It's something our users wanna do. And so now we can then make an assessment about who our competitors are based on that specific story point and whether the customers are satisfied or not. And increasingly actually associate a quantitative value as opposed to a binary value to that level of satisfaction. That, that then allows you to define a competitive set and your opportunity, again, ideally with reference to a specific story point um, about whether you can overtake, whether you can overtake a competitor in that space. And um, there is a book called Jobs to Be Done, pardon me, which provides a framework that allows you to understand whether it's reasonable to overtake a competitor in that space. Are you going to provide a superior product to that competitor? Are you going to provide a lesser product with a cheaper value and so forth? So there's a framework to kind of achieve that. And then that's really the point at which research has a scaled impact. And so these shares, these product-led growth um, um, type frameworks that we produce are evergreen. They characterize our users. Uh, needs, user needs tend to be very enduring. The rigorous segmentation uh, associated with research followed by comprehensive jobs to be done and then an analysis of where our competitors are meeting um, the, um, our users' needs and where we could intervene is a systematic way in which we can shape product strategy to deliver real value to the users. And within that, needs are stable, the competitors change. And so what you need to do is monitor, uh, monitor and dashboard competitor behavior, but at least you have a core understanding of what the user needs are in the first place as a foundation um, within which to build. Also, in the world of product-led -like growth, there is so much emphasis on returning value to customers first. And the operational definition of returning value to customers is addressing their needs. So here in this hyper user centric world, really um, researchers, in, in my view, more necessary than ever um, to again, de-risk these projects to make sure we are solving real needs and to make sure the product has viability in the long term and isn't just gonna get beaten out by a competitor as well. And so with that, I will pause say thank you and open the floor back up to any questions. So, uh, thank you, Matt, for the fantastic presentation. And uh, I am uh, stopping to record from now on and opening the floor for any question. Thanks again, Matt. Yeah, of course.